first. But I, I do have an undercurrent of information for those that are harvesters. And so what I want to talk to you about this morning is I want to talk to you about removing any veil of limitation. Removing the veil of limitation. Father, I just pray that you would take a hold of this word, Father. And again, let it seep into our hearts. Father, germinate it. Father, let it grow within us, Father, that we will not only be hearers of the word, but we will absolutely be functional to put it in play. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, there, and I've been telling you over and 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 over again, and maybe I should say it more often, in, in my persistency of saying it, there is one thing God demands that we praise Him. That we praise and we worship Him. Amen? Amen. And you know what? When we come together in a church setting, it's so vital and it's so vivid. We, we see over the past 11 years that we've been existing as a church, when we begin to praise and worship God here in the house, we see the miracles break loose at times. We see God begin to unleash His Spirit. We see people that have come to the front. They've either been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, or they have been healed of their sickness, their, their problems. Uh, the cancer had been removed. We've had... Uh, aneurysms completely disappear. We have seen the glory of God invade in the house. Amen? Amen. Amen? But it happens with praise. It happens with our praise and our worship. I want to say this before I even get going. People have a tendency all over the world. I've been in a lot of churches, a couple hundred churches maybe in my lifetime, in my travels, and I've seen the same habit throughout the churches. People come in, people get settled in, they come in late, or they come in just in time. We call it the blue light special in most churches. You're not, it's not unique what we see here. And then they get kind of, we have to instigate them by putting the music together. I know that my ability to play the piano is limited, so it doesn't instigate you too much. But I know that when other musicians are here and they, they're playing and the singers sing tremendously, we, we have to instigate people. People have to be instigated to praise and worship. That was never, that was never, ever, ever God's design. I want you to know that when you go back and look at the history of Israel, in the temple, they used to just stand up and they would, in their Hebrew language, sing a song. They, there was no musicians. They would just sing a song. They weren't prompt. They weren't pr pr uh, provoked to do it. They just sang a song. And what God is intending is for us to come in with a new song already in our hearts. So for you to have to be prompted to say, come on, lift up your hands and come on, praise Him. That's wrong. That's totally wrong. It's an error. Because God wants you to be a person that's praising Him and worshiping Him 24-7. You can always tell when a person doesn't really know what it means to praise and worship because when they come in, they're the ones that are a little bit hesitant and eventually maybe their hands will go up this high. They don't understand that they are to be sold out completely to Jesus Christ. You'll also find people, and I'm not saying on any particular person, it happens in every church. Some people come in late because they don't understand. Send Judah first. Praise and worship is the distinguishing thing that God intends. You've got to praise me. So if you are a praiser, you truly are praising and worshiping him in spirit and in truth in your own life. You will be one of the first ones here. You will want to get on your knees and you will want to be ready to go. And when the songs start out, then you'll be lifting up your hands. And I also want to say this. It has nothing to do with the songs. Some people all over the world, people say, I don't like that song, and I don't like this song, I don't want to worship that. It's not about the song. It's about your heart. You should come in with a heart filled with praise already, with your hands lifted up. And I'm going to show you the importance of why I brought all that up. It's very, very important for you. How many of you realize that God has brought everything that He would ever do to the communion table Amen. with mankind. Amen. But then God has involved that man would, man would begin to work with him. God wants, God wants us, basically, he wants, to, he wants us to participate with him. And how's that going to be? I'm going to show you a scripture that proves it. I, I've shown it to the, when we went to the uh, convalescent home this past Thursday, I gave a little bit of a preaching, a preaching teaching. And this is one of the things that God laid on my heart, so I kept it. 
and I want to give it to you here this morning. And it starts out with this. God has spoke through Isaiah, the prophet. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 18, here's what God says. No longer. It's up there somewhere. It's going to come. It's going to show. I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you until it's up there. Okay, that's the songs. There, okay. No longer will violence be heard in your land. Everyone say, no longer. No. You know what no longer means when God says it? It's a done deal. It's finished. It's cut off. It's not going to happen any longer. No longer will violence be heard in your land. Your land is your, your home. It's your family. It's the intimacy of your life. No longer is there going to be a violating statement from the gates of hell to come in screaming at you, telling you that you're going to lose your home, you're going to lose your marriage, you're going to lose your job, you're going to lose your financial support, you're going to lose your children to drugs, you're going to lose your grandchildren. No longer is there going to be any violation to come in, sneak in and sucker punch you in your land. Nor, it says, nor ruin nor destruction be found within your borders. Somebody's asleep back there, not enough sleep. Nor ruin nor destruction be found within your borders. Your borders are wherever you place your feet. Everywhere you go outside the realm of your life, of your home, that's your borders. Whether you go into the workplace, in the school, into society, into the stores, wherever you go. There will not be no longer any ruination or destruction to be found within the areas where you extend yourself. There will not be any violating statement that will say that you're going to lose your job, you're going to lose your promotion, you're not going to get the promotion, you're going to lose your car, you're going to lose everything, you're going to lose your health, you're never going to be accepted amongst the people of your, uh, of your peers. All that is going to be gone away. There's not going to be any more violating statement to come and try to trip you up. Why is that? Because the next statement says, For you shall call your walls salvation. Who gave you salvation? God gave you salvation. For God so loved the world that He gave, He gave His only begotten Son. God loved you so much that He gave His only begotten Son specifically for you. So now we have these walls of salvation all around us. That makes us feel secure. Amen? But then it goes on. That's what God did. Look, look what we have to do. And you shall call your gates praise. If you don't praise God, the gate stays open. And when the gate stays open, then the perpetrator of your soul comes in and constantly is screaming, violating, lying uh, things to you. Telling you you're never going to make it. You're never going to have a job. You're never going to have health. You're going to die premature. So on and so on and so forth. When you praise and worship God, you close the gate. When you close the gate, then you're going to be able to hear the voice of God. A lot of people come to churches all over the United States and their gate is open because they're not praising and worshiping God in their own time, in their own measure. And that's why they don't come in on time. That's why they don't raise their hands on time. When they, when they should be raising their hands and praising and acknowledging and worshiping Him because the gate is open. So if you want to truly see the inevitable supernatural power of Almighty God begin to be, become displayed in your life, you need to close the gate and keep it permanently closed. Amen? Because God wants to do so many things. How many of you know that God can do anything that He wants to do? But because God has chose for you and I to participate with Him, many a time we come to the communion table with God and we have all this baggage. We have all these limitations that we have upon us. But, and and we, we have disallow for God's plan to move in us and through us. But those veils of limitation are removed whenever you begin to praise the Lord. Not just with, with lip service, but in spirit and in truth. And when you are praising and worshiping God, and you close the gate, God will then begin to do wonderful things in your life. The Old Testament says that God inhabits the praises of His people, does it not? 
But I want you to know that God in the New Testament isn't just inhabiting our praise. He is inhabiting appraising people. And He's lifting you up. And He's bringing you to a higher dimension where now you can see what the Holy Spirit wants you to see what He sees. And you can hear what He says. And you can begin to speak what the Holy Spirit is speaking. And no longer speak what the devil is trying to get you to speak. Amen? So I pray that you have a heart this morning of understanding and you will be open to a fresh revelation of God's Word and you will say yes to the revelation and when you do, your veil of limitation is going to be removed from you. And I pray that you go home and you recognize I need to be a person of praise. If you're going to be a harvester, you have to praise and worship. Because if you leave the gate open, the enemy is going to sour you and if you go around with a sour puss on your face, who is going to listen to you? Who are you going to win over for the kingdom of God? You have to have a, a dance in, your, a, a, a dance in your, your walk. You have to be joyful. You have to have the joy of the Lord. You have to have absor absolutely insurmountable peace. And people will see, yes, you're going through. You're going to go through things. But those things won't go through you. You will be absolutely delighted. You will be like Emma with a smile on her face all the time. Even when she's had cancer, bouts of cancer over and over, she smiled through it. She got over it. And people recognize that the Lord is with her. Amen? That's what God wants out of you and I. So I want you to turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. And I want to show you the importance of not just walking in the Spirit. When we talk about walking in the Spirit, we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, and that all goes along with it. But I want to talk to you this morning about keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. When you keep in step with the Holy Spirit, that's when you will begin to see what He sees. You will begin to hear His voice. And you will begin to hear what He wants you to, wants, wants you to hear. And then when you hear what the Holy Spirit is saying, then you are to say what it is that He has said. And that brings us to the understanding that you have been given a gift of prophecy. For those of you that have been born again, for those of you that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, now we put a lot of emphasis on tongues. But how many of you realize that Paul even tells us that tongues is the least of the gifts? When you come to the altar and someone lays hands on you and you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, yes, you begin to speak in other tongues. That is the evidence of what has transpired in you. But the greater, the greater uh, reality is this, that when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, there is an in, infusion of many gifts placed inside of you. Some people receive the gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation, the gift of knowledge, the gift, the gift of wisdom. Some people give, get the gift of healing, the gift of miracles. I saw a guy that had the gift of miracles. It made your breath, it, it, it took your breath away. To see hands that were all crippled and broken and all of a sudden they became absolutely brand spanking new before your eyes. Mm. To see a knee that was completely, you know, swelled up and he just pointed at it and it just, like a balloon when somebody put the pin in it, it just came down. Mm. I wasn't the only one who saw it, so maybe 800 other people witnessed it. The gift of miracles, you have the gift of faith. There's the faith that you receive by hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. But there's, there's the gift of faith. There's the gift of helps. There's a variety of gifts that God will infuse in you, and they're beneficial gifts, so as to build up and edify the body of Christ, to build the kingdom of God. So God gives us all these wonderful gifts, if you will, amen? And he gives us the gift, even though we have all these gifts, the one essential gift we all receive when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit is the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is a gift that has been given to all. That's why Paul said that all may prophesy. It's a gift where you will be able to hear what the Spirit is saying, and you will be able to bring it down, and you will be able to share what the future holds. Maybe something about your own life, or you'll be able to talk to somebody else about what the Lord shows you regarding their life. And it's not to be abused as some people abuse it. You don't turn around and say, well, the Lord told me that you are to give me $10,000, or you're to give me a brand new car, or you're to come and buy my house. No, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm talking to you by the power of the Lord. I'm just kidding you. But that's not, that's not what it's about. You're, you hear what the Spirit is saying. You take His words 
and you begin to speak them. And when you begin to speak them, it drives the words of Satan away. Amen? I'll give you an example of this. Over there in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus turned around and said to his disciples, he said, when he went into Philippi with them, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they turned around and they began to give a whole cheering section of session of information. They said, well, some say. They started a religion. It was a some say religion. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're a prophet. And it all sounded good, but they were a little bit off. They were wrong. But he said, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? That you've been walking with me now for some two and a half years. And it was quiet. You couldn't have heard a pin drop. The reason why? Because every one of these men, first of all, they gave their life as a living sacrifice of praise. They were sold out to Christ, even at the time Judas Iscariot. They gave their life as a living sacrifice of praise. They walked with the Lord hand in hand. Yes, they had families. Yes, they had responsibilities that they attended to. Seven of the twelve men were fishermen. So they went out and they did their fishing. But they spent the other majority of the time with Jesus. And so they gave their lives as a living sacrifice of praise. And because of that, when Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? All twelve of them heard a sound. And they knew that it was not an earthly sound. They heard a voice. And they recognized that it was not an earthly voice. And they heard a word that was coming and bellowing in their hearts. And that word was Christos. 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 And it was the water walker. It was the risk taker. It was Peter. Peter turned around and he pointed at Christ and he said, You! <laughs> you are the Christ! And I really believe that that's pretty much how he said it. Because prior to that moment, there had been many who had come and said that they were the Messiah. They were the Christ. And they were all proven wrong. But Peter heard the voice of the Spirit of God came and brought it down and said, You! You are the one! You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you. It was revealed unto you by my Father which is in heaven. And then he went on and said, And therefore upon this rock, not upon you, Peter, but upon the revelation that came out of your mouth, I will build my church. And then he said this, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. How does that apply to you and I? When you close the gate and keep it closed by praise and worship in spirit and in truth and in habit, in habit, the gate remains consistently closed. You are going to hear the voice of God. And as you hear the voice of God, God is going to give you directives. He is going to give you direct prophetic insight of what the future holds, maybe in regards to somebody else. Maybe it's your Uncle Joe. Maybe it's your Aunt Jean. Maybe it's somebody in the church that has a, a negative terminal report from the, the doctor. But God gives you a positive report and says, go to them and tell them they are not going to die. They are not going to be sickened. They are going to live. And when you go to them and you open up your mouth, you carry the utterance of Almighty God. And when you carry the utterance of Almighty God, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And you will begin to see the outcome you've been praying for. But a lot of people are praying for a wonderful outcome. They're praying for somebody, but their gate is open. And they can't hear what the Spirit is saying. Therefore, they don't have any utterance in their mouth to be able to speak a prophetic word to that individual or individuals. Therefore, you have to understand, the gate has to be closed. Amen? So let me show this to you. Revelation chapter 3. Are you getting this, church? Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. Notice he says, not when. He didn't say when anyone hears my voice. How many of you have actually ever heard the voice of God absolutely point directive to the situation of what you needed to hear for? Amen. Not many, okay, not many of you. I'm going to tell you, it's because your gate's not closed. Your gate's not closed. Close the stinking gate. 
close the gate, be a person of praise and worship. Amen? He said, if anyone hears my voice, then your respons responsibility is open the door. Open the door. And he goes on and he says, and I will come in and dine with him and he with me. Look what it says in chapter 4, verse 1. This is a statement that God had spoke, Jesus had spoke out loud to John, the beloved, the apostle John, who was on the Isle of Patmos. They tried to boil John, they tried to kill John. John was completely, probably had no hair on his body because he went into boiling oil. He, his eyes were probably, you know, somewhat closed. He, had, he looked really bad, like maybe a monster, so to speak. But you know what? He stayed alive because Jesus needed to use him to write the book of John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So therefore, God was not going to be outdone by somebody trying to kill this man. So here's John the Beloved on the Isle of Patmos, and he receives this voice from Jesus. And there he turns around and it says in John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, a door was opened in heaven. So obviously John heard the voice of Jesus, recognized it to be the voice of Christ, and responded to it and opened up the door. Where's the door at? Where's the door at? Don't sit there. Come on, talk, talk to me. Where's the door at? It's in heaven. It's in heaven. We have been taught that the door is in our hearts. The door is in the heavens. Some people have a hard time with that. If you have a hard time with that, we need to get rid of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, where the Bible says that God has made us to be seated in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. You have been able to be seated in the heavenly places. How do you get seated in the heavenly places? Close the door. Close the gate. As you close the gate by praise and worship, I told you the Spirit will then take you. He will inhabit a praising people and lift you up to a higher dimension so that you can have a topographical view. You're not going to see things in the moment. You're going to see things in the future. If you are high, you can see far. If you are on ground level, you can only see what you can see. Amen? So we come to find that the door is in the heavens. It's in the heavenly places. It says, we come to find it, uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, and he says, After these things, John says, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Come up here where I'm at. Let me show you the future. Let me show you tomorrow. Let me show you the outcome that you can't see on ground level. That can only happen how? Come on. Close the gate. Close the gate and hear him. He's saying to John, come up here and I'm going to show you great and mighty things you know nothing of. No, John, I'm not going to kill you. No, John, you're not going to lose your life. But I want you to come up where I'm at so that you can see the great and mighty things that I have for you. The world wants to know what tomorrow holds. And so the world, un, un, without knowing Christ, they go after psychics, they go after palm readers, they, go, uh, they, they uh, strive toward New Age people. They want to know what tomorrow holds because there's that uh, unquenchable de desire inside of them. They want to know some things about the future. You're never going to know the truth of what tomorrow holds unless you tap into the one who created tomorrow. Jesus Christ has created your tomorrow. And in order for you to know what your tomorrow holds, you need to have a relationship with the Master, Savior, and Creator, if you will. Amen? And so if you want to know what's going to take place in the year 2020, in the year 2021 or 22, then you have to be able to hear the voice of God today in 2019. I don't know about you, but I don't want to have God do something in 2020 or 2021 and I'd be on the tail end with what he's doing. I don't want to see the fumes of what he's already done and turn around and say, man, I wish I would have been there. I want to be on the cutting edge with God. I want to be on the cutting edge with whatever God's going to do. I want God to be able to say, I can use you because you've already seen. I want you to know you are never going to partake in anything that God is going to do unless you have foreseen it. You have to foresee before you can participate. Amen? 
And so you, in order for you to foresee, you have to keep the gate closed. I'm going to keep on hampering on this. You have to keep the gate closed so that you can hear what he's telling you, so that you can see what he wants you to see, so that you can be on the cutting edge with what God's going to do whenever he comes and he begins to do it. Amen? Yeah. And so we come to find that John says in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, Jesus said, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. And verse 2 says, immediately, I was in the Spirit. Immediately. Immediately, I was in the Spirit. Don't be moved by magazines. Don't be moved by the media. Don't be moved by news reporters. You can only be moved when you say, okay, I need to hear a little more clarity. And you begin to become more intensified in your praise and worship. That's what John is saying here. Immediately, I was in the Spirit. Immediately, when, God, when Jesus said to me, come up here, I needed to get in the Spirit. I needed to get in the flow of praise and worship so that I could have any remnant of any veil of limitation moved away from me. Amen? I'm going to show you some fine examples of removing the veil of limitation. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. I know that I've given this, this uh, story to you not too long ago in detail, but I'm going to give you some of the fine-tuned points of it so that you can have an understanding of how this all works. It said, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary. This is John chapter 11, verse 1 through 3. Okay. And it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now look at verse 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus tapped into a heavenly dimension and was able to see the future that no one else around him was able to see at that moment of time. Verse 6 tells us, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. Verse 8 says, the disciples said, Rabbi, lately the Jews tried to stone you. You mean to tell me you're going there again? You know what he said? You better believe I am. I'm going to go there, I'm going to go, get, uh, go there against all of their offensive statements and all of their actions of trying to kill me. They're not going to touch me. You know why? Because I have heard from my Father's voice. And I have the utterance of God regarding that of what I said. That Lazarus is not going to die. This sickness is not unto death. I carry the utterance of my Father. And when you carry the utterance of your Father, no weapon formed against you is ever going to be able to prosper. The gates of hell shall never prosper against God's Word. So Jesus is saying, I'm going back. And they're not going to touch me. They're not going to hurt me. Because God has, my Father has given me a plan. I am to go there and lift Lazarus up. Is really what he's saying here. Amen. And then you go back to verse, you go down to verse 11. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I am going to go, that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus was speaking of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus, verse 14, said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Look down at verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Go down to verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. She responds, Verse 24, Lord, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection. She had a death mentality. She had a veil of limitation fogging her heart, her mind, and her spirit. She believed, as every one of us, this is as good as it gets. You, uh, you live, and you get sick in due time, and you die. And that's the way it is. There's no turning it around. There's no return of any sort. That's the common way. 
Parents get sick, they die, we bury our parents. That's the way it has to be. And with her, it's her brother. So she's saying, I know that my brother will rise again in the resurrection. Jesus comes to her and says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Then he asked her a question that was so impacting. He said to her, Martha, do you believe this? She had to come to a decision, a crossroad of decision. She turned around and said something for the first time that she had belief in. She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. Prior to this, prior to this, even though they were dearest of friends, the whole family, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and Jesus, they believed Jesus was a good prophet with power. She didn't know him as he was the Son of God who has come to save the world. But now he said, do you believe that I am who I say that I am, that I am the resurrection and the life? That if you believe in me and accept me, you shall have eternal life. She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Son of Almighty God. Verse 38, then Jesus again, groaning in himself, he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay by it. And he turns around and as the stone is there, he goes before the stone. And Jesus says to the disciples, remove the stone. Martha, who still had a remnant of, the, uh, of limitation on her, she said, but Master, do you not realize that my brother's been dead for four days? He stinketh. He stinketh to high heaven. That boy is stinking. You don't want to remove that stone. He said, remove the stone. Then he turned around and he said, did I not tell you? Did I not tell you, Martha, that if you would believe in me, that you would see the glory of God manifest in your life? And she, turned, she said, yes, Lord. He turned around and he yelled out, Lazarus, come forth. Now, you all know why he yelled out Lazarus, right? Because everybody would have come out of that grave, at that, that, that port. He said, Lazarus, come forth. He was saying to Lazarus, get out of there, boy. Get out of that dusty place. You go back home because you've got to take care of your sisters, Mary and Martha. What are you doing laying around thinking you're going to lay around for eternity? You get up and you get going back. And you go get your job back and you take care of your family. And so with that, there was a wonderful, there was a wonderful resolve. Because Jesus had no veil of limitation upon his life. And because he had no veil of limitation upon his life, you come to find that he was the one that saw the outcome. He was the one that had the utterance. And he had to get her to agree with him. She had to have her mind up into the heavenly places as well to be able to agree with what Jesus already knew. Amen? And Lazarus came back to life. Isn't that a beautiful story? Amen. Don't you wish that that would happen today? Amen. Well, I'm going to give you a good testimony. My father, my father was 78 years old. My dad, for many years, was of a different religion than we are. I'm not going to say it because we're filming. <laughs> and my dad didn't want anything to do with what my sister and I jumped into. He thought we lost our minds. So you come to find... You come to find, is it not working? Battery's blinking. Okay. You come to find that he basically didn't want nothing to do with it. But you know what? I went every day. Every day I went to his house. Every day. My dad was starting to develop a little bit of, we thought, dementia. And every day we went to his house and we, uh, I went to his house and I, I, I prayed with him. I read the word of God to him, little excerpts that he could understand. And I constantly, I, had, I would have lunch with him because I eventually moved my office into his home and I spent quality time with him. My mother had long been passed away. And so with that said, that you know, he was by himself in this home. So I spent time with him and I kept on reading the word and kept on reading the word and faith was developing in him. Well, it came to a place. One day we're driving down the road and I said, you know, Dad, we had found many letters of communication between my mother and Rex Humbard and Pat Robertson. My mother accepted the Lord. My mother had some illness that she couldn't go to church, but so she kept continual uh, application with Pat Robertson mostly. 
And there was this correspondence, and we found the letters that she accepted Christ. And that, that really brought a cheer to our heart. Well, I shared that with him while I'm driving, and I said, you know, Mom's in heaven. I've accepted Christ. I'm going to heaven. Patty's going to heaven. Dad, you need to make the decision on your own. He got all teary-eyed. He says, I want to go to heaven, too. You want to accept Christ? He said, yes. So I pulled over. I gave him a very simple sinner's prayer. He said it, and you never know if somebody just saying something. But I got to tell you, my dad came in the church, started coming to our church, but he was totally offended by it one time. I know Sandy remembers this. He'd come to our church of 800, 900 people. He was the first one out of the pew. He'd come to the front, hands raised, dancing and singing before the Lord. I mean to tell you, he intimidated people. The people that were so, you know, dignified. I, I can't do that. They started to feel intimidated. They started coming to the front. My dad was totally sold out to Christ. My dad believed anything that the Word said, I'm going to stand upon it. There was a time where I was invited to go and play the bass in uh, Rex, uh, R. W. Shambaugh's Tent Revival Service for three days in West Middlesex. My dad came with the rest of our family. All three days he was there, all three days he came to the front, one of the first ones there. He wanted to get healing for his eyes. My dad was totally sold out to Jesus Christ. Now I want you to know that 1979... My dad had a full-blown issue of Alzheimer's. My dad also struggled for many, many years from the age of 12 to the age of about 58. He had emphysema. He also had what is called a Mediterranean lung disease. People that are in Europe, from Europe, they get this at times. So he had all these complications, and these complications caused problems, whereas he couldn't, uh, he couldn't breathe a lot, uh, very well. And so he would get bouts of pneumonia. And then we would have to take him into the hospital two, three, four times a year. They would give him the shots. They would put a tube down his throat while he's awake, and they would have to expunge the, the mucus that are built up and around his bronchial passage. And it was just horrible to see him struggle. He was gagging while they were doing it. But nonetheless, you know, when it was over, in a couple of days, a day or two in the hospital, they'd release him. Well, on this one particular day, and I'm not going to get into all the details, he goes into the hospital in a coma. He's in a coma, and at the end of a day, you can hear the death rattle that's starting to come. And uh, my sister, my wife, and myself are there, and we're, we're teary-eyed over the situation. We just believe that this is it. We were Martha. We had a, we had a, a, a death mentality. We had a, a remnants of a bell limitation of how this is how it has to be. The doctor, I, I told them to go home. I stayed there with him all night, prayed, had a little... Pocket Bible, New Testament pocket Bible, I read it, kept on praying, Lord, just take him in peace, you know, given all the sweet things to say. The next morning, Dr. Greco, who's a Christian doctor in Beaver County, he comes and he says, well, Sam, it's about 7 o'clock in the morning, he said, you can see your dad has all these complications, and on top of that, the lung disease, the emphysema, the Alzheimer's, now look at his neck, he said he's all swelled up, he's dying of uh, uh, congestive heart failure. He said, I don't see him lasting till noon. So, you know, I took it as what it was. He's the doctor. He knows best. When, the, when my, my sister and my, my wife came back in, we believed that. And I shared that with them, and we're crying. And my sister, we're gathered around his bed. There's a little, uh, I call her a candy striper. She's a nurse's aide, young lady. She's kind of staying out of the way with us. We're in the bed. We're in the room. And they have all met he already, medically, they've already said, you know, he won't last till noon. We gather around his bed, and we're praying, and we're singing. We're singing a song that he absolutely loved. Oh, the blood of Jesus. That's all he wanted to sing since he got saved. My sister noticed at first, as soon as we were starting to sing and we hit the name Jesus, his body very minorly convulsed, just a little twitching. And we kept on singing and kept on singing. And every time we sang the name Jesus, a little bit of a twitching. And we kept on praying. And then we'd sing a little bit more. And every time we, we purposely now, we were catching on. We purposely now were saying the name Jesus and sing. And his body was shaking. i I got to tell you, the rest of the story is a fog to me. And I believe it's a fog to everybody else. Because within a matter of moments, my dad was sitting up in that bed. My dad had his complete faculties about him. He knew my name, my sister's name, my wife's name for the first time in two years. 
He hadn't known my name for two solid years. He didn't know who I was because the Alzheimer's had taken such a hold on him. He sat up in that bed, the, the, the nurse's aide, she's sobbing like a baby, she's trying to do her thing, she's washing his face, she's trembling, and she's cleaning him up, and she puts him in a, a, a chair, a wheelchair, and she walks him past the nurse's station. And they were dropping their papers <laughs> to see the dynamics of what God had done. Dr. Greco, who's a Christian doctor, he came and said, I know that God did this. Can you mind if we just kind of test a little bit to see what did the Lord do? Maybe it could give us some input for other patients of sort. We bring him in, they bring him into the solarium, and in the solarium are all these people sitting around, and there's a woman playing the piano who used to attend our church. What is she playing? Oh, the blood of Jesus on the piano. It was like we walked into a movie, and we were the, we were the extras that somebody paid us for. It was wonderful to see. So I want you to know, praise and worship is the key yeah, to seeing man. the dynamics of any miracle you don't even expect to see, it'll come to pass. Amen? Amen. It'll come to pass. Look at John chapter 10. Look at verse 1. We still okay? Still blanking. Okay. Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Look at verse... Look at verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes, does not come, except to steal. He's talking about Satan here. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling, verse 13, flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. But verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep and am known by my, by my own. Look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. How do you hear his voice? Close the gate. I want you to catch this. What do you mean with your ears? Close the gate. You in another church, another sermon? Close the gate. My sheep hear my voice by keeping the gate closed. Because the voice of God is a small, gentle voice. The voice of Satan is loud and infuriating. God gives you his word. His word is his image. Satan gives you his word. It is an image. Satan wants you to see the image of destruction and despair and sickness and disease and death. God's word is healing and virtue and power, prosperity and love. Amen? So he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me. Where do you follow him? Onward and upward to the higher dimension. Verse 28, and I give them eternal life. Eternal life. Eternal life goes on and says, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. I give them eternal life. Eternal life in the Greek is zoe. Z-O-E. Zoe life. Not just at the conception of salvation, but as you respond to his voice, you hear what he has to say, and you bring it down on the earth, you have now received prophetic information. And what God will give you is Zoe information, which means you will receive progressive revelation. You will get revelation upon revelation upon revelation. And I want to show this to you at the end as we close here. Look at uh, uh, Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, here we're talking about Saul, before he became Paul the Apostle. He was Saul. Saul was a, a man of greatness. He was a man that had absolutely accomplished so many things. He was not only a Pharisee, he was the chief of the Pharisees. He had accomplished that he actually went and went up the ladder, the ecclesiastical ladder 
of championship that he memorized the first five books of the Bible. He knew everything about the law. That's what the Pharisees did. They knew everything about the law. They had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. If you want to be a Pharisee, I'll have you go ahead and memorize the first five books of the Bible, and I'll see you in about ten years. But anyhow, he memorized the first five books of the Bible. He knew everything about the law because the Pharisees, their main duty was they wanted to make sure that all of Israel followed everything to the T of what the law said, which was an impossibility. It was an absolute impossibility. But they also, they wanted to be glamorized. You come to find that the Pharisees, first of all, were the wealthiest people in Israel. Because everybody looked at them as with idol worship. They gave them money. They took care of them. They, 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 they just absolutely was uh, you know, in love with them. They, they were like a, uh, one of the superstars of, a, of a, a sports team. That's how they looked at these men. And they had a certain type of wardrobe on that they made themselves look immeasurably holy. And they wanted to make sure that they didn't have any lust in their eyes, so they always either kept their head down, and they put these, uh, these, these folders around their eyes, because they didn't want to look at a woman for fear that they would have lust. That's why they called them the bump and fall. Because they were bumping into things and they were falling all the time. Never mind. Anyhow. <laughs> but they were Pharisees, and they, they hated Jesus. They hated him. Why? Because they had won, they had won the attention of all of Israel. But here comes Jesus, and he's a lowly looking individual. There's nothing handsome about him, but he comes with power. He comes with authority. He's healing the sick. He's opening up blind eyes. He's raising the dead. The Pharisees can't do that. And they're saying, he's stealing the sheep. We need to get rid of him. Jesus turned around. He knowing that he came to die on the day of Passover, he starts his moment of intimidation. He started intimidating them. He started kind of pushing at their forehead a little bit. He said, you are nothing but a brood of vipers. You are nothing but the blind leading the blind. You are nothing but cemetery plots. You look like the, the, the whitewashed cemetery stones. That's all you are. You're putting heavy weight responsibility on the people that you yourself can't even maintain. And he's coming against them and coming against them. And they hated Jesus. That's where, that's where Saul's at. Saul is out to kill anyone who's following Christ. He goes to the high priest asks if he can get permission to have a decree where he can go in through the area of Damascus and take anyone that's following Christ and have them, have them uh, uh, incarcerated and eventually executed. If you remember Stephen, the, uh, the follower of Christ, when he was about to be executed, they were about to stone him to death and he looked into heaven and the heavens became open and he saw Christ seated at the right hand of the Father. It was Saul who was the chief Pharisee, put his thumb down, kill him. That was his intention. I'm going to go and I'm going to, I'm going to gather all those who follow Christ and I'm going to have them killed. Well, on the way, you come to find he's on horseback or whatever animal he's riding, camel, we don't know. But it says here, as we look at this, it tells us, verse 3, as he journeyed, chapter 9, verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light showed around from him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, Lord? Isn't that something? He is trying to be all that he can be to serve God. He hears the voice of God. For God so loved the world that he gave a son, and God came down in the form of a son. He heard the voice of God, but he doesn't even recognize it. Doesn't even know. And it says here, the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It was hard for you to kick against the goats. It's hard for you to kick against heaven's plan, is what's being said here. So he trembling and astonished. He is folding up because he has a veil of limitation on him. He has, he has baggage on him, even though he thinks that he is high supreme because I'm a Pharisee. But when he hears the voice of God, he begins to tremble because he realizes that he's nothing. He's nothing. He said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Saul wasn't yet saved. 
So when God spoke to Saul, there was limitation on the conversation. Go into the city, and I'll tell you furthermore what you're going to do for me. When God speaks to the redeemed, there is no limitation on the conversation. When God spoke to that of Abraham, he said, you will be a great nation. When he spoke to that of Joseph, he said, you are going to be a great prime minister. When he, taught, when he spoke to Daniel, he said, you're going to be a great right-hand man. God, when he speaks to you, if you can hear him, because why can you hear him? The gate is closed. Then there he'll give you the details of the end of the story for your life. Amen? But here we find, verse 8, So Saul rose from the ground, when his eyes were open, he saw no one, but they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now, he goes into Damascus. On the other side of the city is a follower of Christ by the name of Ananias. Ananias is there. He is praising. He is worshiping. He is a man that is sold out to Jesus Christ. He has walked away from Judaism. He is now completely engulfed with Jesus. He loves him to death. And he's saying, here I am, Jesus. I am here, Lord. If you ever want to use me, I'm your man. And all of a sudden, he hears a voice, the voice of Christ saying, Ananias, can you imagine? What that would be like. You are praising and you are worshiping. And you hear the voice of Jesus. And he calls you by name. And he said, yes, Lord, here I am. I hear your voice, Lord. What do you want me to do? He said, i got a plan for you. I want you to go to Straight Street. i got a, I got a street number. i got a street. i got an address. Where am I going to go? I want you to go to the house of Judah. And I want you to stay there. Because, yeah, Lord, I'm going. Whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to say, I'm there. I'm going to do it for you. He said, because there's a man there by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And I want you to get, wait a minute, Lord. Hold on a minute. I thought it was you, Lord. <laughs> I thought it was you. Satan, you almost got me on that one. Want me to go talk to Saul of Tarsus. Do you not know? And he said, I want you to go. God's saying, I want you to go. And I want you to go and lay hands on Saul of Tarsus that he may see. He said, Lord, do you not know that he is of the old? And I am of the new, and he has a decree in his pocket to come and to arrest the, old, the, the, the new and destroy them? And God says, you know what, Ananias? I knew you were going to behave like this. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. So if you look at verse 12, he said, I've already shown him your face. You have no place to hide. You're going to go do what I told you to do. And so basically, look at verse 17. Ananias went. He went like God told him to go. He entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul. I can imagine he went to the house and says, B -b 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 Brother Saul, please don't kill me. Please understand, God told him, I just want you to go to the house. All I need is your face and I need your presence. You don't have to work up a 12-part sermon. You don't have to work up a long speech sermon. All you have to do is go there because you already have. You're carrying my utterance. That's all you need. So he goes there, and he lays his hands upon him. And let's read it together. And Ananias, he went his way and entered the house, laying his hands on him. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight. Isn't that what Jesus told him to do? Just go and lay your hands upon him that he may see again. That he may receive your, that you may receive your sight. And, that's why I bolded that out. And, where's this, where's this and coming from? That's not what Jesus, Jesus didn't say anything further. He said, just go lay your hands upon him that he may receive his sight. That is called having a prophetic anointing, bringing a prophetic word into the scenario. But then, here comes progressive revelation. Ananias didn't realize God was going to use him for even more information. He said, that you may receive your sight and receive ye the Holy Ghost. And at that very moment, at that very moment, Saul is now baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Amen? Immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scales in verse 18. And he received his sight at once, and he arose 
and was baptized. The veil of limitation was removed from Saul. Was removed from Saul. You know, in Acts chapter 12, verse 14, there you come to find that Jesus was in a prison. He was trapped between 16 guards that held him incarcerated. The Bible says that God sent an angel. The angel came in while everybody was asleep, and the angel told him, dress yourself, get up, and the angel took him out. And as the angel took him out of that prison, and the outer gate was open, Saul, uh, Peter, I'm sorry, not, not Saul, Peter was set free. Now Peter, that while he was in prison, there was a number of saints that were in a house not too far away that were praying earnestly for Peter. They were praying and praying for Peter. Peter goes to the house to let them know, I've been set free by the power of God. An angel came and set me free. Peter goes to the house, and they're all inside praying, and Peter's knocking at the door. And Rhoda, one of the women in the house, she comes and she's, she's gingerly wondering, you know, who is this? Because they were afraid. They were going to get... They were going to get martyred. She opens the people and she sees Peter. She's shocked. She runs back to tell them, Peter's at the door. Get out of here. Peter's not at the door. Peter's dead. Now they're praying for Peter, but they too have a veil of limitation on their, on their eyes because they think he's dead. Well, what are you praying for? What are you praying for? And she had to, she had to go back and tell them, Peter, Peter's knocking at the door. Thank God Peter kept on knocking. And he kept on knocking, and finally she went and she opened the door to prove to them it's true. Jesus said, I stand at the door and I knock. Thank God he keeps on knocking and knocking and knocking. And he's praying that you will be a person of absolute praise and worship. Not just on a Sunday morning when you have instruments and people trying to instigate you to praise and worship, but that you will be a person who absolutely loves the Lord so much that you will be inspired to praise and worship Him in spirit and in truth, in all things at all times. Proverbs 3, 5 says, uh, trust, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, lean not into your own understanding, and in all things, that means everything, everything, anything you can think of, acknowledge Him. That word acknowledge means magnify Him, lift Him up, praise Him. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Well, what do you mean? If I lift him up, he's... No, he's, he's already in heaven. Yes, he's already in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. But if you lift him up, if you lift him up in your praises, he will come down and lift you up Amen. and raise you up above the situation. Amen. Then you will walk above your storm, walk above your problems, walk above your, your circumstances. That's what Jesus wants out of you. Amen. And he keeps on knocking. And if, if anyone could hear his voice... He will tell you what will take place in your life after this. He will show you the beauty of your tomorrow. Otherwise, if you leave the gate open, that's as good as it's going to get. You're going to have problems and situations and circumstances. We're going to go through them, and they'll go through you. But if the gate is closed, they won't have any access to embark on your life. Can you say amen? amen. So with all that said, I'm going to turn that furnace down because I'm dying of heat. And I'm going to ask each and every one of you, very quickly, I want every one of you, except for Emma, to come up here. Thank you. Lord. Every one.